Well, welcome guys and girls. Um, very good to have you. I hope you're all dealing with this lockdown as productively as possible. And by that I mean tying hundreds and hundreds of flies for destinations that we may yet uh, or may not yet be able to fish for months to come. So uh, I've done a lot of tackle prep um, and re-prep. I've unstrung all my, my reels and backing and redone them and redone all my knots over and over again because it helps me uh, beat this cabin fever. But um, yeah, um, I'm starting to get quite a few more people there that are joining in. There's the captain. How's it going, guys? Dead Drift SA, what's up? Jen Dawes, how you, Jen? Good to see you all here. Okay, so um, I'm going to do my very, I do tend to, to talk quite a bit, so I'm going to do my very best to keep this as, uh, as close to an elevator pitch as possible. I'm going to strap uh, a pattern and uh, I'm going to sort of scroll through this up and down intermittently to have a look of, 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 of at any of the questions that you uh, guys and girls may have posed. But um, we've got quite a few people on there. So I'm going to start chatting about this. Right, um, the reason why we elected to choose the, fi the, the, the tiger clouser is because, um, first of all, it was suggested by a plethora of people on a poll that we ran this week. And also looking at um, the Tiger Talk groups and, and chatting to a lot of people and experts in the industry, it looks like that this season is going to be First of all, quite a late season, and as a result of the high rainfall early on, that points to the fact that we're going to have quite a productive fishing season on the Zambezi and the sort of um, the popular tiger fishing destinations towards the end of the year, which is a godsend for those that are usually uh, sort of preparing to go there now in the next couple of weeks as a result of the pandemic that we're currently dealing with. So that's good news for us all, and hopefully with that hope that... Uh, there's a, it could be a nice late season here. Um, we can start prepping accordingly. So the tiger clouser um, is a broad brushstroke blanket term for a clouser minnow variation that is aimed primarily at the tiger fish. So I'm going to show you guys and girls some different tiger, sorry, some different clouser patterns here to give you an idea of how the tiger clouser itself varies. And like I said at the beginning of the video, the tiger clouser is more a recipe than a specific uh, color combo. So here is a saltwater clouser minnow that I have strapped. Um, lighting there is not 100%. It's not terribly good. I don't know if you guys can have a look at that. It loses its colors if I come a little bit too close. So this is tied with uh, predominantly... Um, synthetic materials. It's dressed quite heavily and um, this is tied to sort of imitate your fusiliers and your bait fish and uh, things like that that you'll find in the surf zone. Um, not to say that something like this won't work for tiger fish but it's very different to some of the tiger patterns because being a more heavily dressed pattern getting to depth or getting in the water column um, is not as much of a requirement as we would on a boat on the drift where you've got limited opportunities to sort of pepper your cast into likely looking holds and things like that so i'm sorry to be holding my pattern there but that seems to be where the lighting looks the very best that's a good example of a salt water heavily dressed uh, clouser pattern here's an exceptionally big clouser pattern which i'll show you guys over there it's got mega eyes on it this is a dredging pattern uh for much bigger uh you hold my cap over the fly that's actually not a bad idea there thanks the captain that's for much bigger game fish and for dredging around bombies and off drop-offs when fishing on the flats is not uh what it's is not what it should be so you can see that that's quite a heavily dressed pattern okay and then here's another variant of a salt water pattern that's a more natural color it's in anchovy it's got a light bottom it's got a dark overture on the on the top of the fly okay again quite a bit more heavily dressed than the more sparse tiger flies that we use in fish 
And then finally, here's a smaller sort of intermediary pattern and the tried old chartreuse clouds of minnow, which a lot of people in the industry would uh, basically revere as the single greatest fly of all time. And I tend to agree with them. Okay, so those are some clouds of variance. The clouds of variance that I'm going to show you guys how to tie today are significantly sparser. And the reason why we do that is for several reasons. First of all, when you need to get your fly down deep and you need to do so quickly with a limited space uh, or a limited opportunity to put your fly in a likely looking hold, the sparser the fly, um, the less water resistance it's going to have as it's sinking. Okay, so the flies, as I'll show you now, are quite a bit sparse. In fact, they're exceptionally sparse, comparatively speaking, compared to the heavily dressed saltwater patterns that I showed you. This is a color combination that worked very well for me uh, last year and the year before that. I think last year was an exceptionally difficult year for most of us by virtue of the fact that um, the water levels were exceptionally low. There was a lot of pressure on the Zambezi. And if, you're, if you thought your fly was too sparse, I would generally have recommended trimming it down to half that level of uh, material density to make it even more sparse. Um, Vian, who's joined us over there, had some very good success with this pattern here, which is also just a, a variant. As you can see, that's been chomped and that's been nibbled, and he fished that in Gombe Lodge, which I was very fortunate, privileged enough to fish with him last year. Very, very cool new venue on the, on the Zambezi, but you can see how sparse that is. Um, here's an all red color combo. You can see with some very light barring. Here's an all black, which is my go-to and my favorite color combination. Again, give you an idea of how sparse that fly is. And here's a sort of olivey red color that also had some very, very good success. And again, if we're looking at that for comparative purposes, if you look at the difference between, say, a tiger clouser and your saltwater pattern, you can see the difference in the sparseness and how dense or the, the lack of density, rather, the lack of density thereof in the Clouser patterns. Okay. So, um, the Clouser pattern is tied with a combination of Bucktail and SF, or Steve Farrow Fiber from Fishiant. Um, the reason why I prefer that in lieu of an all Bucktail fly is just for durability. Um, you, you know, it, uh, you've, Tigerfish go through flies like there's no tomorrow, and personally, with the limited shots that you have at likely looking lies, I don't want to be fanny assing around on the boat changing flies. So if I can fish a fly for as long as possible, I'd like to do so. So I prefer to sandwich the SF fiber in between two clumps of bucktail, which I will show you guys how to do in due course, also to prevent wrapping of that SF, which is also a complete ball ache when you're trying to, when you cast off the cast on the Zambezi and you're just trying to get your fly in those likely looking lies. So it's got a uh, SF fiber, it's got a little bit of bucktail. The eyes that I've elected to use here are tungsten eyes. Okay, I've selected ones that are slightly smaller than the five millimeter. In my experience, I found that that was an eye that was perfect to get the depth that I was looking for quickly and efficiently, but also not being like casting a, um, an anvil on your nine or 10 weight setup and uh, less, less likely to hurt you when hitting you in the back of the head or hitting your fly rod and breaking it. Um, you know, when, when fishing in, in, in gale force winds, which does tend to happen in the season that we're fishing. So I elect to use tungsten, okay, which is, in, which is considerably denser than lead. It's also a lot more durable than lead. So a lot of the lead eyes available, I'm not saying they aren't, they aren't good, they're great. They tend to, uh, they're not as durable in those tiger fish's teeth. And also when hitting the hull of the boat that you're fishing, that happens quite often. And anyone that tells you that doesn't happen is lying to you, irrespective of their level of expertise. It happens to the best of us. So tungsten's a lot more durable. Um, it's a lot more compact, which is also important by virtue of the fact that tigerfish has interlocking teeth. So the smaller the pattern and the smaller the eyes or the, the weighting method or the keel method you have on the fly, the greater chance you have, or sorry, the less chance you have rather of that fly proverbially getting stuck in those tigerfish's teeth where he'll clamp down and you think you've got a good hook set meanwhile. He just opens his mouth later, shakes it out, and your fly comes out. So smaller dumbbell eyes, even though 
they sync more efficiently are going to result in far more hookups uh, more often of the more often um, while you're fishing so also you speak to a lot of the should we say proverbial old salt old salts that fish the zambezi and fish the zambezi often they'll tell you that a tiger fly gets more effective the more it gets eaten and chewed and the sparser it gets and i think there's a lot of merit to that i think we tend to overdress our flies and our we tend to overdress um our patterns far too much especially in overly pressured water so um go sparse uh go little um tend to go smaller particularly in areas like sacoma and alombe and even uh ngombe lodge where we were fishing um, last year, I tend to go a little bit smaller. The hooks that I use, um, hook selection is also exceptionally po- important. The hook that I use and that I is, you know, is highly, highly, highly believe in is the Gamagatsu B10S. Uh, uh, the reason why is, first of all, it's a very strong hook relative to its gauge. Secondly, it's an exceptionally sharp hook, which is um, unequivocally important when we're fishing for tiger fish, which... Um, other than top and probably have the most difficult jaws to set a hook in out there. So the B10S has a very thin gauge and is very strong relative to that gauge. And as it's a very thin gauge or a thin wire hook, less surface area means far greater hook penetration uh, capability. Um, Over and above that, the hook tends to bend rather than break when it's in, uh, you know, being subjected to undue pressure in a tiger fish's mouth and you're putting maximum pressure on that fish. Why is that important? That's important because a lot of the harder hooks, a lot of the stronger hooks, stronger, harder hooks with less flex in them tend to glance off inside the fish's mouth. Okay, whereas a, a hook point that bends tends to bend into and drive uh, uh, far deeper uh, into a bony mouth. That's something that Francois Boerta taught me um, when he asked me to strap him some Goliath tigerfish flies. Uh, the hooks that he actually wanted me to use were really out the box. I never personally would have, have, have selected those those hooks. But he wanted me to tie on owner worm hooks, which is um, typically a bass hook. And that made no sense to me. But, you know, when you're thinking about it logically, when that fish that it's super hard mouth engulfs that fly you want that hook to get as soon as it gets the tiniest amount of purchase you want it to bend and bend in and drive into the bone in lieu of glancing off and finally the b10s has a very straight point which is important um i fished the zambezi quite a bit um i've been fishing the zambezi for around 10 11 years I've had some good success. I've had some good seasons and bad seasons. But anecdotally, in my own experience, I have found that the other hooks like the SL12S, uh, etc., do not have nearly as good hook penetration abilities or capabilities as the Gamagatsu B10S. I know that Kona have released a new hook, which is their Stinger hook. It looks really good. I have used it. I haven't used it um, enough to give a very accurate sort of analysis and synopsis thereof. Um but I'm sure I will in the oncoming seasons, provided that we're not in corona lockdown for eternity. But right now, my go-to hook is a B10S. What size? Okay, so the B10S gets, uh, you know, goes from, I think, from a size 8 all the way to a 2.0. Um, I think the 2.0 is a very strong hook. I've caught um, very big uh, Jack Crevel in Belize, up to 20, 25 pounds on that 2 hook, and I put maximum pressure on that, and they held up just fine. I just seem to, uh, you know, obviously to try and uh, put all the odds in my favor as much as possible, I prefer a smaller hook. Again, less surface area, thinner gauge wire is going to penetrate that tiger's jaw far more efficiently, and as such, I tend to prefer either a 1 or a size 1 B10, B10S, which are more than strong enough. I put maximum pressure on my fish. I'm fishing 30-pound fluorocarbon. And also, when hooking up on the reeds and things like that, when I'm trying to break off, I can tell you in no uncertain terms that I'm having to pull exceptionally hard. And nine times out of ten, the line will break before that hook opens. So size 1 and size 1 are the sort of sweet spot of the B10S that I select. Okay, so... 
the materials that we're going to use to tie the tiger the tiger closet yeah there's uh what's up barry he was with me when i put some they put that serious pressure or the hurt on those uh jack Ravel with that uh b10s 2 which again just cements what a strong hook it is um the, hook, the materials that we're going to use we've got a b10s we've got a 1-0 in the in the in the vice here um i've got some body wrap material uh, for all intents and purposes, I'm going to be tying with olive because the pattern that I am going to be tying, the color, the color combination of this pattern I'm going to be tying is that little guy over there. Okay, so I've got some olive body wrap. I have some Danville's 210 denier flat wax thread, okay, which is important. I prefer this thread because I feel other than um, the nano threads and the GSP threads, this tends to... Um, bind the dumbbell eyes to the hook far more efficiently and that's important like i said earlier when you're casting the last thing you want to do is uh you know casting you hit the hull of your boat and that's the end of your eyes so it's very irritating so flat waxed thread i've got two different colored bucktails over here i have black and i have chartreuse which is a color that a lot of a lot of people or seasoned tiger anglers would probably turn their nose up and think why is this chartreuse and then i have this bleeding perch color of Steve Farrah blend. Okay, um, I don't add any flash to my tiger flies. Gareth Coombs of Sacoma and Elombe Lodge tends to actually pick the flash out of his flies and his lures and his afrojigs, and he seems to think that that makes them far more effective. And we're a seasoned angler who probably fished that river more than anyone else I know, if not ever, um, you know, tends to say something, then I'll, I'll listen. Okay, so yeah, I've got uh, the grip tungsten uh, dumbbell eyes, B10S hook. I've got some olive body wrap. You can use flash if you want to. You can use chenille. A lot of people nowadays don't even tie a body. Okay, I've got some Loctite super glue brush on gel. Now, this is important. I prefer this to some of the other super glues because when this gets wet, it doesn't turn white. And I'm going to address the body with this to ensure um, durability in the long run. So I prefer the Loctite, okay, which I think is very important. And then I have some, some art line permanent markers. Now, these are laundry markers, okay. So those don't know if you went to hostel and stuff like that, you wrote your name on your, on your clothing. This stuff is probably the most durable. It doesn't really come out. They don't have a huge plethora of colors to choose from, but they are the most... Uh, um, they tend to, to mark the most effectively and they don't wash out nearly as badly. I keep these on hand in the boat with me and I keep a couple colors. Okay, I've also got some green here in case I need to mark or remark the clouses in due course with some of my other patterns. Right, so let's get started. I've obviously placed the hook in my vise. I'm going to attach my thread. that excess what I like to do is I like to leave quite a nice little space between the eye of the hook and where I'm going to attach the eyes okay um, there's you know there's no real reason for that but that's just more Clouser-esque if you'll see the patterns that Bob Clouser who's the original inventor of this fly strapped and also allows you to get a nice little bit of a head in there so if a fish hypothetically were to look at this pattern and view those dumbbell eyes as the proverbial trigger point or as the eyes of the bait pattern or the bait fish that you're imitating. It's just far more realistic um, to have those eyes a little bit further back. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll move forward a little bit. So I've got a little layer of, of thread there, which is very important before, before I put the eyes on. And what I'll do is I'll attach the eyes in a figure of eight fashion, basically just manipulating the eyes around the hook shank and going wider and wider with each successive figure of eight turn, keeping quite a bit of tension on there to position those eyes, okay? I'll look at it from multiple angles to ensure that those eyes are nice and straight because there's nothing more frustrating for my OCD when the eyes are offset and I only realize this at the end of the pattern. From here, I wanna draw those thread bands around the dumbbell eyes tight to secure and solidify those that eyes positioning of the hook shank. So what I'll do is I'll actually come around and underneath. Three, four, and five. Okay? 
and my next part is I'll do five reps there, I'll do five reps there, okay, and that is pretty tight, I'll then address those dumbbell eyes with some Loctite on the top and the bottom of the hook, and I'll allow that to set, okay, so while we're allowing that to set for a few seconds, I'm just going to go through here and see if there's any questions. Um, yes, B10S for the win. Have you ever tried tying on hypodermic tip hooks, apparently deeper penetration? I've never experienced any hypodermic tip hooks, Luke. If you could perhaps point me in the right direction, I'd be very interested. In. I myself am I'm always looking to learn more. Um, let's see if anyone else... Oh, my biggest tiger is 16 and a half pounds. Um, I caught that surprisingly on my first tiger fish trip ever, and I got that on a black and purple, would you believe it, deceiver. It's my favorite go-to fly. All right, I don't see any other questions there. Um, is there anyone else that would like to ask some questions in the interim while I carry on strapping? That glue should be set. Okay, so what I'm going to do at this point is I'm not going to attach my body braid. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to position that over the top of the shank. I'm going to trap that down. And I'm going to wrap forward. And I'm going to stop just prior to the hook point. Okay. As I said, I want to make this fly sparse. I don't want to overly dress it. And I'm then going to move my thread back to in front of the eyes. Okay. From here, applying some decent... Tension, I'm going to wrap my body braid forward and I'm going to ensure that I do so with turns right up nice and tight to one another. Mm, it's a horrible looking piece of cock that's just standing out there from the body braid. So I'll just trim that and I will move forward like that. As soon as I get to the eyes, I'm going to wrap the body braid around the eyes several times, okay, in a figure of eight. And I'm then going to secure it three wraps with the bobbin threader that I left there earlier on. I'm going to trim this excess. Now, guys, something that I often do is sometimes I cut in here and I cut into the eye and I then lose the entire body. So just ensure that that's up and out of the way. I'll secure that down. And then what I like to do is again come in with my Loctite and I'll apply that over the entire body, the eyes once again. I'll turn it upside down and I'll add some more to the top and the bottom. That's just going to really cement those eyes into place to ensure that they don't twist, especially when we hit the hull of the, bo the, bo the boat while we're casting and uh, just protect that body. So, as you see here, this particular pattern has got munched quite a bit. Now, if you can have a look at that, that body's been charred quite a bit, but that fly can still be fished. Okay, less time fucking around in the boat and more opportunities to be casting and likely looking lies on the drift. What vice do I use? I'm using a Renzetti Master vice. Okay, which is quite a decent vice. And, um, yeah. Any other questions that you guys want to ask? I'm just waiting for this this uh, Loctite to set. Okay, so I'm going to flip the vise upside down, okay? Um, the, another reason why I like the Clouser pattern is because the weight is on, or the fly is weighted to hook right up, the, the weight, the dumbbell, keels the fly. You are not obstructing that hook uh, or that hook purchase while you are fishing for tiger fish. And that's a massive problem, especially with overdressed flies. So that's another reason why we keep them sparse and another reason why the clouser is so effective is that you will have materials here, but those in no way, means, or form are going to impede that hook purchase, which is very important. Um, will chenille work? Okay, hold on a second. What size eyes? Like I said, I was using uh, the grip. I think these are the 4.6 millimeter tungsten eyes. Those are the best size found they're not too big um, and thus create a potential um, 
well, they, they would impede the, the, the hook purchase, okay, getting stuck in the tiger's teeth. So this is a nice size that's small enough not to do that, but obviously still heavy enough to get the depth that we're looking for. Ever make bodies out of UV flash boot to put the resin on? I do that often. If you have a look here, this pattern here that I have tied for salt water, that body is made entirely out of flash boot. Okay, will chenille last versus tiger's teeth? Absolutely not, Barry. I'm very sorry about that. But then again, you only need to catch that one special fish. So if you're prepared to tie dozens and dozens and dozens, you can do so. The, the tiger is not going to refuse that pattern because it has chenille. But bear in mind that that chenille is quite a bit bigger and bulkier, and it's not going to sink as effectively as more sparse material. Okay, smallest and biggest sizes you fish them in. I fish these in a 1.0 and a size 1, Peter. I size uh, slightly, these are a 4.6 millimeter tungsten grip hook. Okay, I prefer super glue um, because the super glue is quite a bit stronger and the Loctite tends to soak into the materials far more efficiently. Um, uh, historically, I used to use resin, but you know, after a couple of fish biting it, you could see that the, the tiger fish themselves have almost grated that resin off there. Darren wants to touch me. My friend, I'm sorry, you're going to have to wait in line. Tiger's mom has already booked first ride of refusal. Um, what wire would you recommend to use with this pattern? I'll get into that. Um, that's the travel, st the travel stick. So if you'll look at these patterns, I've actually pre-wired these with a material called not to kinky, okay, which Scientific Anglers now brings in. This is an incredible uh, wire because it's extremely strong. It's unbelievably flexible and it does not kink nearly as badly as the typical bite wire that we've been using the Zambezi for years and years. I will be posting a step-by-step -step tutorial. As you can see, I use crimps here to attach that. And I once again crimp a very small swivel onto the end there. And um, this can with handle many, many different tiger fish. It's got a 35 pound breaking strain. It's extre extremely thin diameter. It doesn't flash nearly as badly as some of the other wires. It's not as thick as that Rio knottable rope. And because I'm using crimps, I have a very small, very neat setup, but I will touch base on that. That's a whole other discussion and, and step by step. Why don't you like bass? You Have you heard they think they toilet? As if what? Luke, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. There's Rue. What's up, Rue? There's Jari. How you doing, guys? Okay, and that's a very good question there from Mr. Ratty Fishers. Where did you learn about the not to kinky and sleeves? My good friend Andrew Rattray and another good friend of mine, Ryan French, actually um, introduced me to this pattern. I've done a few alterations and I've modified it. And as uh, and Andrew will tell yourself, I've completely over-engineered this unnecessarily to make um, the trace that I have here. But it's an unbelievably smart trace. And in lieu of tying your flies on and off, you clip them on and off with a Rio um, Fostatch clip or a Mustad Fostatch uh, clip, which I'll talk about. Anyway, back to this pattern. So we've got the body in. We've attached the eyes. That super glue has, has dried. Now, what I said earlier is that I like to sandwich SF fiber uh, in between two sort of clumps of bucktail. That's far more durable, and in, in so doing will prevent this fly wrapping, which is a complete and utter ball lake um, when you're on the Zambezi. So the first thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to get some chartreuse, because most boat bait fish are lighter on the bottom and they're darker on the top. I don't have any of that gorgeous Primo bucktail that Rupert and Jari have, so I'm going to have to select some of this toilet. Select a nice little clump there. Now, this year and this season, the water levels are looking significantly more productive and, uh, than they were last year. Last year we had a terrible dry season, and that's why we went so sparse. So this particular pattern, although still sparse by Clouser standards, is going to be slightly bulkier than the patterns that we used last year. So what I've done is I've cut a little piece of bucktail, and I want to make sure that they're all more or less the same length. So what I'll do is I'll come in there, and I'll just pull out some of the longer pieces to make sure that they are uniform. 
And then I will do that once again from the other side to get rid of some of those stragglers. Okay, so I have a, a more sort of uniform clump of bucktail, which has got... I'll try and move this light so you guys can see this more efficiently. It's got a more uniform sort of base. Right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie this in. Whenever I tie my tiger clouses, I like to look at my fly from the top to make sure that they are tied equally over the top of the hook shank. Okay, and this first clump is going to be approximately twice the length, if not a little bit shorter than the shank of the hook. And I'm going to secure it with a couple wraps. And I don't want to tie it too tight because I don't want that bucktail to flare unnecessarily. Now, when I trim, I want to ensure that uh, the bucktail doesn't impede the hook eye, okay? Because that's a ball ache when you are finishing off the fly. So I lay my scissors, I hold the tag end up and I lay my scissors flat against the eye at a slight diagonal angle. And I trim it like that. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take my black permanent marker and I'm going to come in here and I'm going to bar this pattern so long. So when I'm barring this, I like to pinch all of those bucktail fibers together and I will come in here and make some little stripes equidistant apart, turn the fly over, do the same thing, pinch them nice and tight, all right, that's our bucktail, I'm now going to attach, attach my Steve Farrow blend, okay, um, this is one of my favorite colors for tigers. It's bleeding perch. It's got a little bit of red in it, uh, which a lot of uh, seasoned tiger fishermen seem to think uh, elicits some sort of trigger response from the tiger fish. And it's very natural and very sort of bream-esque, which is one of the predominant food items. I'm going to select a sparse, but slightly less sparse, clump than I was using last year. As I said, this water levels are going to be a little bit higher this year, so we don't have to go too sparse. Okay. I'm also going to pick out the ends there to make sure that this is a little bit more equal. I don't like trimming clouses. Okay. That's my Bleeding perch, as it's called, Steve Farrow blend, and I will then lie that over the top of the hook shank. Now, this particular piece is about two and a half to three and a half times the length of the hook, which gives it some fantastic movement in the water, uh, but not too long that it's going to wrap. Okay, and I'm just going to spread that equally on either side of the hook. Tie that down, and in exactly the same fashion that I did earlier, I'm going to come up, take that tag end, lay my hook against the hook, my scissors against the hook eye, and trim that so it's up and out of the way. Okay, so what you can see is that chartreuse is actually starting to blend in there nicely. It's not as fluorescent or as porno as some of the other chartreuse flies. It just adds a nice sort of subtle underbody to this otherwise olive pattern. Okay, now to finish off this pattern, I've got black uh, bucktail, which is pretty much like straw. Okay, absolute garbage. It's not like the stuff that Rue and Jari use. So what I like to do is I actually like to come onto the back of the material and I select the slightly softer stuff. 
Now, this stuff doesn't have to be too long, okay, for the top portion. Because, again, this is merely acting as a slightly dark overbody, but that final sandwiched bucktail to compress the SF and prevent it from wrapping while we're fishing. I'm going to go in there and just tweak and play around with those materials and those fibers until I'm happy with a consistency and a density. Just swapping it from hand to hand until I've got more or less what I want. It's a bit thick. That's just going to add that dark overbody and help sandwich that SF in there nicely. Okay, this is approximately, if not a tad shorter, the same length as that first and initial bucktail, chartreuse bucktail clamp that I put in there. Again, I'm going to lay that over the top of the fly. I'm looking at the fly from the top. And I'm going to tie it in by its tips. such okay what I like to do at this stage is I'll take all of those materials and I will pull them back again I'll manipulate them a little bit just get them to blend in there a little bit all right once we're at this particular point I'm now going to whip finish as you can see We'll come in a little bit closer, you'll notice that that hook eye and that head is not big um, by any means. I'm going to come in there now with a lighter and I'm going to neaten up um, some of those tag ends. What I also like to do is I keep a razor blade so I can actually come in there and just neaten that up accordingly. Get rid of some of those fibers that may be impeding the eye. But at this particular point, I whip finish. I like my heads of my tigers to be perfect. My tiger clauses. So I whip finish and I slowly and tightly wrap my way forward to ensure that that head is nice and neat. At this particular point, I have a lighter, and I will just lightly come forward and just get rid of all those loose tag ends that would otherwise be distorting a nice head of the fly. I come again with my black marker, and I just simply, because this tends to soak into the thread, so apply very light uh, strokes. If you push too hard into this, you're going to have a completely black head, and that's not going to um, that's not going to be commensurate with the color scheme and flow of the fly that we're looking for. So I'm just going to apply a little bit of a light, very light. Okay, and you'll see there. That's the color combo that. looking for right at this particular point um, again I'll take the Loctite and that's because when I have used UV glues and resins in the past the tiger tends to rip that off um, even the thinner resins don't tend to soak into the materials quite as effectively so I'll take my Loctite I'll just address that on there And I'll allow that to sink. Sorry, allow that to set. And you can have a look at that fly so far. Okay, and what I like to do is you'll see that those bars that I applied, they are very subtle. They're not overbearing. Okay, I like to take my red permanent marker which is also outline and I give it just a tiny little bit of 
gill flash behind the eyes. And what I'll do is I will take this and I will dress it from behind the eye to the first bar that I made with the black permanent marker. Just like that. Okay. Looking at this particular pattern, I think I can actually come in here. I think I was a little bit too light-handed with the permanent marker to begin with. And I'll come through here and I will lightly go over... The marks that I I made earlier. And you can see how that fly is starting to take some pretty decent shape. I'm gonna go over one more time with the red. This stuff doesn't sit as nicely in the naturals as it does in the synthetics. That's why I carry these permanent markers with me. And every sort of 30 or 40 casts, I just uh, reapply. Okay. This fly is still not finished yet. I've obviously applied the Loctite. Getting rid of some of those scraggly bits. All right. I'm going to go over it again with some UV. In the meantime, I just want to go through some of um, your questions. So let's have a look here. Right. Have you tried Copic markers as they have a lot of colors? Yes, I have an exceptionally large selection, actually, of Copic markers. But I find that they regrettably don't... Um, they don't mark as effectively and they tend to run a little bit. Um, they're not, they don't mark as effectively as the art line. So unless you're dressing those specific materials with a, with a lacquer of sorts or perhaps a UV flex glue, which I do for quite a lot of my flies, um, you're going to be reapplying very, very, very often. When and where are you potentially going? Um, look, uh, Sakoma has got a special spot in my heart, uh, as does Ilombe, so... Uh, provided I'm not entirely break, uh, broke by the end of this uh, pandemic, I might m most probably be going through there or again through to Ngombe Lodge, uh, which I was very fortunate to fish last year with uh, Francois Boerta and Vian Ferreira. Right. Um, come throw that in the Eastern Cape Salty? Yes, I'm sure it would. What range of sizes will you tie this pattern in? Okay, so uh, as I said, you are more than welcome to tie this in a variety of sizes. There's no right and there's no wrong. A lot of the commercially available tiger fish clauses that you get go right up to 2.0. I have found that I prefer the 1.0 and I prefer the 1 because of the, the less surface area, less metal uh, without compromising, of course, strength the less hook penetrating ability that that, that that fly has. So typically my flies are a lot smaller and a lot sparser. So um, you'll see that this is the pattern that I used um, last year to some very good success. Um, and this is the pattern that I've tied for you guys today. This new pattern is a little bit less sparse. So it's got much more density of materials because like I said the water level this year is going to be a little bit higher uh, the fish are hopefully not going to be as skittish as a result of the volume of water and the abundance of food and and less pressure um, that they will be under from netting and anglers and you want a profile that is going to be slightly more visible so that's the pattern there I think that that Loctite has just about set so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here now with some Solar rays UV thin, okay, which is also very, very important once again just to solidify those eyes because you're casting all day, every day, you will hit the hull of your boat and you want to make sure that those eyes do not come off. Let's just hope that this hasn't glued. Oh, there it is. Okay. I'm then going to come over the head and a very thin level, thin layer rather, of solar rays thin. I'm just going to dress that head. While I'm applying this, I want to make sure that the UV 
bleeds a very small amount into the materials that I have tied and also onto the base of those dumbbells, dumbbell eyes wherever I can. When I get to the top of the fly, I'm actually going to put quite a bit of that UV in there, in those wraps of that body braid. And over the top, once again, just to secure that as much as possible and make sure that that sets. Okay, I'm going to give you guys a close-up now. Do I always use silver eyes? I don't, Josh. Um, I'm using silver eyes in this particular pattern because this chartreuse green red color I tend to use in brighter conditions. Um, when it's overcast, uh, I generally tend to go by the truism, darker flies, uh, darker conditions. So um, I will use this color in lieu thereof. It's the same size. But on my darker patterns, I tend to use that in lieu of the silver. What I have found, which is actually very interesting, is that after I caught a couple pat a couple fish on the clouds and minnows with these uh, silver eyes, the silver sort of um, coating on those eyes tend to came, come off and it actually had a coppery color underneath, which again, I believe, may have actually made that fly a little bit more successful. Okay, we're going to let that... Hit that again with some UV before I show you guys. I'm going to give it one, one more once over with the lighter to make sure that that head is nice and sweet. Have you ever tried articulated tails in a clouser? I have not. Okay. And that there is one of my go-to patterns on the Zambezi in brighter conditions. And I'll show you guys what that looks like there. You can see the two pieces of bucktail that will actually go in there and they will sandwich that SF fiber in there. Okay. And that is quite different to the more heavily dressed clouses that I tie for salt water. All right. Ever use the Ufudu eyes? I do use the Ufudu eyes, Peter. I really enjoy those, particularly in my large BDSM patterns. And I actually have a few of these patterns here tied with these Ufudu eyes. I'll show you one here from my tiger box. We'll have a look there. Those are put those Ufudu eyes. If I'm fishing slightly shallower water, slightly slower water, and I don't need to get that fly down as deep, then I tend to use those Ufudu eyes quite a bit. All right, I hope you guys uh, derive some benefit from that. Um, here is the pattern. I'll take a picture of it in hand and I'll post it on uh, my story so you can all have a look at that, at that color scheme. Very, very, very successful pattern in uh, um, brighter conditions during the course of the day for tigers. One of my go-tos. And if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to drop um, me a DM. Drop us a DM. We'd love to field those. We're going to try and make this uh, an ongoing thing to help all of us cope with this, uh, this lockdown. And um, yeah, guys, uh, be safe. Um, I'm wishing you and your family all the best during this trying time. And I look forward to touching base with you uh, with some more of our tutorials in due course. Have a fantastic evening. Ciao, ciao.